Hello. Are we live? Are we good? Okay. Thank yep. you. Thank you so much for joining. Um, so my name is Mitesh Kure. I run um, um, uh, developer student clubs for North America. That's in the U.S. and in Canada. Uh, so we have uh, close to 150 uh, leads running these clubs uh, on campuses, on different universities and colleges. And uh, as you know, some of you even applied to become uh, new leads for next year. Uh, so welcome, and uh, hopefully you invite your other friends to join this stream as well. Um, so I'm going to quickly go through a few um, um, uh, introductions. Uh, so this um, um, the program will be uh, encourage our students to do is learn technology associated with uh, Google and um, anything uh, digital media related, and then see how, whether you can apply some of those skills into solving problems. And uh, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, for your thesis project or if it's for a business uh, or anything like that. So Tibby is from uh, Tibby and both Tibby and Grab. They're both both from uh, Canada. Um, I saw this project and uh, once he shared it, this is a very interesting uh, merge of digital gamification and human human interaction. So uh, that being said, if you have any questions. Uh, please put them on the channel. Uh, we are listening into the chat. Um, and then please uh, welcome to share this with everybody else. And that being said, I'm going to hand it over to Graham, who's going to be a facilitator for today. Take it over, Graham. Awesome. Thank you so much, Madusha. I'm Graham from Sackville, New Brunswick. I go to Mount Allison University in computer science. Uh, very nice to see you all out here tonight. Um, so tonight is a very special night for TB. TB is presenting his uh, final project of the year. It's some really impressive stuff. I, as the facilitator, am here to uh, ask questions for TB at the end. So throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, throw them in the chat at the bottom uh, of this YouTube uh, video, and then I will answer them at the end of the presentation. So, may I introduce TB? Hey everyone, uh, I'm TB from uh, Toronto, Canada, and today I'm going to pre be presenting Light Farm, uh, my thesis project for my fourth year. So, first of all, what is Light Farm? Uh, here I have this uh, YouTube video that I'm going to play, and hopefully that gives you kind of a, an idea of what it is. Light Farm is a game with physical elements that teaches sustainable farming practices. Through the use of a custom touch-based alternative controller, you can explore and maintain a small farm. In Light Farm, you follow the daily life of a farmer and empathize with their struggles. You can explore, solve puzzles, and make tough decisions to learn about the world of sustainable agriculture. Our goal was not just to create a game, but also to have real-world impact. To do this, we decided to focus on the 500 million smallholder farming families which produce 70% of the world's food. Many of these farmers employ farming practices that may be helpful in the short term, but harmful in the long term. These practices not only hurt their livelihood, but also greatly impact the environment. For that reason, it's important to adopt sustainable farming practices for the sake of sustainable agriculture is difficult. To overcome this, we created a game with a highly visual component to improve learning potential and engagement. To make sure we had a solid foundation of content, we worked closely with researchers in the field. We designed content that covers a wide range of topics, including soil health, crop rotation, water management, and many more. As you play, you are faced with decisions that will affect the livelihood of your family and the future of your farm. This is where Light Farm teaches in three ways. It allows you to experiment, and learn from your mistakes, repeated interactions and feedback loops, and revealing the long-term consequences of your actions. So we wanted our project to be deployed to educational agricultural workshops. However, this presented several constraints. The workshops teach using a portable projector and tablets. They are remotely located and have limited access to technology. We leveraged the available technology to come up with our design solution. 
We used a technique called projection mapping to display a texture onto the surface of a physical model. To detect touch input, we used a standard webcam located inside of the controller, which tracks the shadows created by your finger. Combining these two pieces of tech allowed us to create a game that adheres to the constraints, feels natural to interact with, and communicates visuals effectively. This is especially useful to audiences which are unfamiliar with modern devices. Additionally, we designed the controller to be crafted anywhere using easily available materials to address transportation logistics. To create a gameplay that solves our challenge, we spent a lot of time on our design process. During this project, we realized that agriculture is a really complex topic, so we focused on simplifying systems to make them easier to grasp. We also prototyped many different crazy gameplay ideas and interactions, conducted user tests to make sure we were on the correct path, tested a ton of different types of tech, and once we figured out what we were doing, we iterated on our design to come to an optimal solution. In the future, we're looking to deploy Light Farm out into the field. It's our hope that with this game, we can make an impact on the world of sustainable farming. All right, so that was a quick overview of what Light Farm is. It's pretty much an interactive experience slash gameplay which promotes sustainable farming practices. So. I'm going to talk about my journey in creating this uh, project. But first, for a little context, um, uh, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm T.B. Leonov. Um, I worked as an interaction designer and programmer on this project, mostly, along with uh, a few other uh, like smaller jobs. And I have experience um, uh, in AR, VR, and I'm going to be joining uh, Facebook as an AR VR product designer intern this summer. So, um, you know, for my thesis project, uh, this was part of my fourth year requirement for my game design degree. And the first thing I had to do was pick a team uh, to work with for the course of the year. Um, this was my uh, team, and we came together because we had a lot of um, experience and worked on a lot of different um, projects beforehand. Um, here are some gifts of the games we made in the past years together. But uh, we realized that there are three important aspects when uh, picking a team for any project that you might want to work on. Um, one is people have to have the technical skills to cover all the roles needed to complete a project. And you can trust them to do their responsibilities well. Um, you need the soft skills. And by that, I mean people um, can collaborate, work well together, share ideas, as well as be open to criticism uh, while keeping a good relation with your teammates. Uh, and third, um, you must share some kind of common goal. Uh, I found this to be extremely important in my experience. It's, it can uh, unify a team and help boost morale and motivation through difficult times. Um, so for us, these team goals were uh, we wanted to not just make a game, but we wanted to make an experience with uh, potential for impact. And we wanted to make something that we haven't tried before. Because since this is a school project, we wanted to learn while doing, uh, while creating this project. So the next step was to pick a project. Uh, this seemed very daunting at first. We had the choice to uh, follow a personal project or to take a challenge off to, offered by a selection of sponsors. Uh, this is where we found our sponsor and their design challenge. Um, we think it was a really uh, great idea to have picked the sustainable farming challenge because it checkmarked our boxes uh, where we were able to uh, pursue our goals as well as provide uh, resources we wouldn't have been able to obtain ourselves, such as um, field research and um, just giving us a meaningful challenge. So now I'll go over our process. Um, our very first step, um, which was very important was to create a plan on how to tackle the challenge. Uh, this included day-to-day uh, -day responsibilities as well as long-term outline that we wanted to follow. Um, we used an agile model with like one to two week long sprints. And this allowed us to adapt to problems as they showed up. So uh, we established some project goals as well. Um, our experience had to be um, accessible in terms of uh, available tech, as well as a, a wide audience. Um, it needed to be culturally neutral, so no geographical or cultural references should have been included. And it needed elements which promoted gamified learning. Uh, 
So this meant having the visual aspect, uh, goals for players to follow, and so on. So um, initial re research. Um, then um, when we started doing some research, because um, we needed not only to understand the topic, but as well as our audience. We needed to understand what farmers were going through to make something that could really help them. And we needed to um, research the topic because we needed to know it before we could teach it to someone else. So this took a long time and um, helped us determine that simplifying all, all these uh, systems, because it was a really complex topic, uh, would be ideal. So to work within the time constraints, we focused on a single main topic, which was soil preparation. So then um, our next step for us was brainstorming. And we used a couple of methods to follow our brainstorming. And uh, we used uh, divergent and convergent brainstorming, which um, so divergent brainstorming means that uh, how we followed is we broke apart into, uh, uh, we broke apart individually to try to think up of all the different ideas we could possibly think of with no limitations. And then we brought up all the ideas we had together to be able to uh, pick apart uh, while we um, like take pros and cons from the different ideas and also try to include the limitations that we had and make them fit together in some kind of way. So at the end of our brainstorming sessions, we ended up with this huge like Excel sheet of all the ideas we had. And it was quite long. We had over 60 different ideas of where we could take this. So that was like uh, a bit crazy because we weren't sure like we had to analyze and um, categorize them based on like what the pros and cons were for each of them, which ones we liked. And we, we just tried to understand them and take them all seriously to uh, pick the best uh, the best one. And then, so the next step would be to prototype some of the initial ideas. So what prototyping is, is that we're trying to rapidly test ideas without um, committing too much time to them to be able to like really understand like which ideas we should follow. And it also helps us communicate and visualize our ideas as well as explore different areas and categories. And then after we create these prototypes, the point is that we also evaluate them. And this depends on what the prototype uh, entails. But uh, for us, our evaluation was based on how well does it fulfill the user needs? How much does the high level concept attract the user because we wanted uh, people to like our project? How well does it appear to the client because they were also involved in this? And how does it excite us? Because it was really important that we were motivated to work on this as well. So right away, we picked four of our top ideas that we got from the brainstorming. And we split apart individually. And we created four different prototypes in, in the first week that we wanted to test these ideas out. So what we got was, um, first, we had this uh, exploring um, social VR, um, a mixed reality learning experiment thing, where we would have people manually try to uh, take care of their farm. Uh, another idea that I worked on was an AR science museum, which is if you think of kind of like a uh, kind of like um, if you think of a science fair, there's like different booths, so you'd be able to use your phone and uh, scan uh, on your using AR like these different booths, and be, it would show you different types of things. Um, another one was an interactive visualization where this would just be like a mobile app where you'd be able to analyze and learn about soil and all these types of farming practices. And the last one was a gamified video course where uh, you would have game game elements, which would um, promote you to watching all these different educational videos. But these were just like uh, initial uh, prototypes that we um, created. We didn't think too much of them. Like um, we weren't um, sure which one of these we would pursue. We were just trying to test them. So our first step was to uh, evaluate them by analyzing and um, critiquing them uh, when we came back together to uh, uh, to present them to each other. And then we would have to rethink these ideas and maybe take different elements from each of them and combine them into one idea. So now this is where the converging thinking comes in, where we had these crazy ideas um, which weren't necessarily um, uh, 
uh, applicable for our project or for the tech challenge. But now we had to also add the tech limitations and to think about those and kind of constrain ourselves into what we were actually able to uh, develop as a final product. So um, we got the idea of uh, using the projector that they had available to create this, uh, to use projection mapping. So what this means was that we have uh, some kind of physical object and then we would have map a texture and then using the projector, we would be able to uh, sh show the texture on the real physical objects. And these were some uh, some pictures from our very first prototype. We just quickly, uh, as you can see, there's like, um, we, we whipped something up. That was just like a, a box made out of paper. We quickly glued it together. We uh, modeled something on the computer just to see if it works, you know, just to get the idea across and to see if like this is even something we should pursue. And then, um, then we had this like mock-up of what maybe a final project could be. Um, we used Legos to create that little uh, the little plant, and then we would place it on the on the box to imitate some kind of interaction of what uh, to kind of get the feeling across of what you'd be able to do with the final uh, prototype. But again, that's just a general idea that we had. Uh, none of it was set in stone yet. So how did we determine a direction to follow? Um, after we uh, created that small prototype, we, again, we decided to split apart individually. And uh, because each of us had this ideal vision for a project in our head, uh, we decided to create um, some pitches about our idea, our uh, ideal um, final product. And then uh, after we each created presentations, we pitched it to each other. And then based on those pitches, uh, we explored different um, ways we could use projection mapping to showcase these farming practices. Now, because all of us had slightly different ideas, we wanted to make sure we got rid of the bias for, um, I guess, each of us voting for our own idea because we had to choose, somehow we had to choose one idea to follow through. We can't focus on all three, on all five of them. So what we used was an evaluation matrix. And then we gave each of our presentations uh, a score based on factors that we chose beforehand. And these factors were how excited we were about the idea, um, how feasible it was uh, with the tech, and how useful it would be um, to the users. And then based on these uh, scores that we, um, that we gave each of the presentations, we were able to make a uh, um, a decision on which idea to follow without um, without including our bias for our own personal um, ideas. And that's how we reached a, a final vision of what we were trying to go for. And it started with this sketch on a notebook that one of us uh, drew. And it, um, it kind of represented a self-contained self world which you could explore and you would be a farmer on this world and you'd have to take care of it. And then after um, getting the idea, then we started building uh, some of these boxes. Here you can see um, the very first version of our, uh, uh, our physical diorama that we tried projecting on to follow this self-contained world idea that we had at first. And then after that, all that was left was to iterate on it and improve it and build out our idea. So that meant exploring the tech to build it and test visualizations and test the learning aspects of this idea, right? because that was the whole point of it. So by exploring the tech, we tried a whole bunch of different um, ways of implementing our, our um, input. Um, we tried Connect, we tried Arduino, we tried Leap Motion, a Wacom tablet. All these were different ways we tried to like uh, figure out the hand input. And so we ended up going with the Leap Motion at this stage of the project. And then we also had different tests for visual direction, like how should all the visualization, sorry, visualizations look like, and how all the different elements would look like in final project and all of these took time and lots of different tests and uh, ways of showcasing and 
uh, because there's so many different parts to it. It took a while to try to uh, merge them all together, right? Um, and here's the first uh, interactive prototype that we, well, if, oh, sorry. Little technical difficulty. Uh, here was a very, um, the very first interaction prototype that we managed to have working, and here you can see me using my finger to move along the surface of the of the box, and it translates to you using a plow on the field. That was the idea that we're trying to recreate, and in here we were using a, a leap motion to track the hand movements. And then we went on to improve from the basic cube that we had at the start to a more complex shape in the projection mapping aspect. And while we were doing all the all these iterations, we we had to have a way to evaluate our progress. So how did we do this? Uh, mainly by user testing, because it was hard for uh, us to say if um, if we were moving in the right direction or not. Because since we were working on this project, we would be biased to um, like it more than maybe a random person on the street would be would uh, would think of it. Like they would think of it in a in their own way, right? Without uh, the bias. So uh, we did a bunch of user tests um, from people like our classmates to at one point we had uh, some high school students come in and test our uh, our project to. Um, near the end of the project, we went and tested with um, with some elders at an elderly center because they closely um, resemble our target audience. You know, people that aren't necessarily very familiar with uh, with breaking uh, with, with new technology, and they may have some accessibility uh, problems. So that was our a really good uh, user test for us. So of course, like throughout this whole process, there were it was inevitable to run into some problems. And some of these were, um, to start off with, a touch detection was a big one. Um, like I said before, we were using this leap motion to, uh, uh, to detect our uh, fingers on the, um, on the box. But when we tried testing them with, with the users because they weren't uh, already familiar on how they had to hold the hand for it to be tracked well, it didn't work about a third of the time. So imagine if you're using a computer and um, a mouse um, doesn't register a third of your clicks, right? That would be super annoying and frustrating. So that was really obvious for us as soon as we did our first test that we needed to do something different to fix this issue. So our um, we did more research and we found this solution online where you can use a webcam to uh, create a, a touch surface pretty much out of anything if you are able to uh, see the shadows of your fingers when you tap something using computer vision. So we decided to implement that, and that, that improved our uh, touch detection a whole lot. It was almost, uh, it, it was really reliable afterwards. And then another issue we had was projection on 3D surfaces. Um, uh, which are really specific issues, I guess, to this project. But we had to make sure, like, because we're using this projector, um, it was really easy to have things that were misaligned or stretched, uh, or it w they were just not visible on the diorama. So uh, a lot of uh, small tweaks had to be done to make sure everything was visible and looked nice on the final product. Um, another issue was a game versus education, because um, we were trying to have this educational game. Uh, there are two different um, ends to this spectrum where if you focus too much on the game side of the project, or if you include too many game elements, you might end up with something that's like Farmville, right? It's all game, no education. But if you focus too much education, again, this can be become really complex and might not be as um, entertaining for someone and it might not uh, be as viable to someone that's just learning about this stuff for the first time. Um, 
And how we managed to go around that was we had these really important decision moments within this uh, within our narrative, where you had to pick a good choice and a, and a bad choice. And that was our teaching moment. And between these uh, decision moments is where we decided to add the game elements. So we were able to layer the game elements and the entertain, uh, sorry, the educational elements um, by taking turns on how we focus on them, I guess. Um, so that's how we got around that issue. Um, but I want to focus a bit on the on the timeline of this project. Um, I made this diagram to showcase roughly how much time we spend on different sections of the project on a week by week basis. So we started with um, here you can see in the blue we started with research and ideation at the start, but that quickly got replaced by a lot of time spent on prototypes and iterations. That's the yellow side. Um, this was the biggest chunk of the time that we spent on the project. And this uh, involved solving all the problems that we expl that explained and developing our ideas and testing them out. So as you can see, um, we locked in our idea, our final idea, and started implementing the final content, which you can see with the, with the purple, uh, at the last month or so of the project. So we were not sure what the project would end up looking like or working like for sure until that very last month, which is kind of crazy to think of um, in terms of like out of eight months, I only I was only sure of what we were making at the last month. All of the other one was process and going solving problems and trying to develop our idea further and further. Um, so what did I learn from this project? Um, I learned a bit on how to work on the technical side because I haven't worked with computer vision or projection mapping before. I also had, um, I had to practice my design skills uh, throughout the, the project you know, with all the interesting problems that showed up and the obstacles we had to face. Uh, but I think the biggest takeaway from the project was the long-term project mentality. And um, what I mean by that is that before this project, I've only really worked on short-term um, projects at most one to two months. Right, like uh, either school projects or my co-op. Um, uh, so I'm used to de designing an idea, prototyping it, you know, polishing it, and handing it in kind of shortly after, in like a, a short uh, time span. Um, so I was used to being rewarded or getting the, that uh, dopamine hit, dopamine uh, hit after finishing a project and being a relief that it was over, like kind of quickly after starting the project in the first place. It, it, it was happening in small cycles, right? Because that's how uh, school assignments kind of work. Uh, but this project was by far the longest project that I've worked on. So um, I noticed that it was it, uh, during uh, having this really long time uh, to work on a project um, throughout the timeline, it's really, um, it can be really easy to either get distracted, lose motivation, you know, um, because the project is so open-ended, it's hard to brainstorm days after days after days and knowing which ideas are good, which ideas are bad. Um, you can focus too much on with the, some small details um, and um, it might feel like you're going in circles, even if that's not the case. Uh, it's easy to spiral into like losing track of the big ob objective. And if you have nothing to show or to see uh, at first, like um, when you're doing brainstorming or researching, yeah, it's kind of hard to see if you're making any progress at all. Um, but um, I found it really helpful to just, uh, when you get to like those uh, difficult uh, uh, times, I guess, is to like kind of just take a breather, clear your mind, and focus on what the big picture goal is. And if you kind of lost mo motivation to like, because you're not seeing any kind of reward back from all the work that you're putting in, uh, I just you just kind of have to push through the tough times and hope that you'll get rewarded at the end of it. You know, for all the hard work that you're putting onto this long project. Um, so for us specifically is that we entered this contest, um, the 2020 Intel University Game Showcase, um, when we finished the project. And uh, last week we were, um, and this was um, a competition where around 25 schools from North America 
uh, presented one game each, I guess. And uh, we managed to win the Innovation Award for our game. So that was really nice to uh, be rewarded for the hard work that we did on this project. And that kind of concludes my presentation. Um, now I think Graham has a, can have some uh, questions maybe. I'm not sure, I haven't been looking at the chat. Yep, for sure. Uh, so we've got a few questions in the YouTube live chat. If anybody else has any questions, please feel free to throw them down there. Uh, the first question I see on here mm -hmm. is user testing. Yeah. So you did a little bit of user testing throughout the process. Mm -hmm. uh, when did you do the user testing and how did it affect the development of your project? We did user testing. Um, we tried to do it as often as we could. It was kind of hard to do uh, specific user testings because um, because of issues with the physical diorama. Like uh, since we had those like kind of wonky dioramas at first, we didn't have like a final product yet. It was kind of hard to like set those up. Uh, but we tried um, doing user tests at different uh, points in the project, like as soon as we had a very first like touch input, that was when we did the user test with the, um, with the high schoolers, which was about three months-ish into the project. And that's when we realized we had a real big issue with the touch input because uh, like when you do user tests, those are kind of your, those should be your go-to feedback, uh, um, I guess, technique, because if you, I, as a designer, you can you can kind of tell like something is good or not. You know, like if it's really obvious, you can tell like, hey, this is kind of bad. We should fix this. But as a one one uh, one thing that's really hard to kind of guess is how someone else is going to experience what you're building. Right? That's like a really hard thing to guess because you've been working on this and you're already familiar with the idea throughout the whole process. And it's hard to get, to imagine what it's like to see it for the first time, you know, getting that first reaction is really hard for you to guess what that might be like. So it's really important to do user tests um, as much as you can really to get that very important feedback. For sure, for sure. Um, so you also talked about how the planning phase uh, ended up taking a, a fair bit of your project because you had you had the initial bit, but then you kept on iterating and iterating and iterating. Yeah. That was a huge, huge endeavor. Um, so when you started, what did you expect it to turn out to be in terms of planning versus the actual development uh, versus how it ended up being? Right. Well, um, here, uh, first I started planning. And it's kind of like a really rough, like, um, I guess, a strategy that we use. So like, these are just very basic steps, like analyzing goals, research, ideation, prototyping, right? But these don't exactly tell us. This was the very, um, our initial, like, strategy. But this uh, didn't tell us exactly what these steps would actually entail, right? Um, Normally, when you're prototyping and you're ideating and you're trying to find the best solution, the, the first solution that you try out is not going to be the best solution most of the time. You're, um, and as you develop it, it's going to slowly veer off course to what your initial vision is into something completely different. Like I've never worked on a project where, where I pictured something at the very start and I ended up with that right away. Uh, it always kind of goes into a direction that you don't really expect. And I think that's a really part important of the process. Um, if you if you get exactly what you expect, I feel like maybe it's too simple of a project or you haven't been open-minded enough, I guess. Very true, very true. So I noticed that the main development of the project started after schools had closed. Yeah, yeah. How did that affect your development? Because you had to do all of that remotely. Did you use some tools to get you started and collaborating effectively? What strategies did you take? Mm -hmm. um, 
I think this is kind of specific to our project. Um, we managed to build our final like physical diorama right before school closed. So we didn't actually have to meet up physically anymore. We're done with that part. And one of uh, my teammates took that home with him. Um, but that did provide some challenges because it did have the physical aspect. Um, that meant that all of a sudden we weren't able to test it on the physical diorama anymore, right? Whenever one of us changed the code or wanted to test an implementation, um, we had to ask this teammate that took the physical diorama home, be like, hey, can you quickly get on? Can you uh, test out this code for us? And um, one of the ways we kind of got around it is that we developed this debug mode where you were able to um, kind of uh, imitate the, the finger taps by just clicking with the mouse in the game engine. However, that presented its own challenges because all of a sudden you weren't sure if, uh, because the system was complex, you weren't sure like, hey, if, if this works with our debug mode, is it gonna work on the real life thing as well, the same? So um, there was, uh, it did add some challenge because it became a bit harder to collaborate, but uh, because we had a lot of previous experience working together, there weren't like, there weren't any issues that we couldn't solve already, I guess. We were already used to kind of working together, so that made things smoother. Cool. We have another question here from Amber Collinsworth. Uh, were there any features that you and your team talked about uh, adding to this project that you weren't able to add due to the time constraints or for some other reason? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, Usually, I heard the saying a lot, but in when you're trying to make a game, um, the, the game is not done when you finished implementing everything. The game is done when you run out of time because you'll never be able to implement everything that you want to. Uh, and I think that usually rings true because yeah, there's we had lots of ideas of what we could we could have implemented, but we were because of the time constraints, we had to cut down a lot and really only implement like the really the parts that we thought we were really important and yeah that meant focusing instead of like focusing on 10 different areas of sustainable farming we chose only one and we only made one level for it and we only made this uh very specific um narrative that you had to go through because we we only had the that specific amount of time to implement them all cool so playing off of that when you talk about sustainable farming and creating a gamified education experience, what are the differences between what you've created and something like Farmville? Um, that's a good question. Um, so like I said, Farmville, it's kind of, it leans more on the gaming side because it has lots of game elements and it's very addicting and it really it's there to kind of um, to get players to play the game, right? Like its final point is to get players, uh, sorry, uh, to get players to keep playing the game and it doesn't have um, really an educational, like uh, a goal to it. Uh, whereas our experience is, uh, is not repetitive. Like once you play it once, you kind of, uh, you already know what's happening. There's like no new elements that show up and there's no like progression. Uh, it focuses a lot more on just getting the message across in an interactive way. So um, yeah, we focus more on just, uh, in, instead of adding, um, adding new challenges, like uh, one of the things that uh, software slash products and games differ is because games um, at, at their core kind of uh, add challenges for people and people get joy by solving those challenges. For example, in Farmville, the challenge is to grow your farm, right? So that's an artificial challenge that you didn't come up with. The game gives you a challenge and then you're kind of having fun trying to solve it. But uh, in a product um, slash um, software, the user already has a challenge. So for us, the challenge is, hey, we we want to improve our farm. We want to get better yields. We want to be sustainable. And the product is trying to help the user with the challenge that they already have. So I think that's like 
at its core the biggest difference between the two. Very cool, cool. Another question from M. Faizan Rafiq. During the research and ongoing development, how did you manage the technology selection and exploration with so many options? For instance, the leap motion, the webcam, et cetera. Um, the same way we did everything else, we, we prototyped them. We, we spend like, um, depending on which one, some of them were really fast to prototype. Some of them took a little bit of research and implementation, but um, it was like within a really small time frame, like a week, we had each of them uh, implemented. And then we looked at each of them and was like, is this, what's, what's the pro and con to each of them? For example, the connect one, they're really good at tracking body movements, but it's really bad at tracking fine motor. So you can't really kind of, specifically point somewhere on a on a on a box and tell where the and the connect can tell like where you're pointing because it doesn't have the fine motor movement whereas the leap motion was really good but you had to be your hand had to be in a specific shape to be uh, recognized otherwise you would just get those uh, dead uh, the dead interactions you would lose tracking right so we just looked at each of the pros and cons of each of these and at first, when we looked at those uh, technologies, we thought the leap motion was was kind of good enough, but we would just have the person sit in a specific spot where the hand would be kind of like close enough. But that also turned out to be you know, not reliable enough. So that's when we did a second pass through and looking at different technology and researching them. And that's when we found uh, our final solution, which was actually um, acceptable to us in terms of how well it performed to and then we stuck to it because it got the job done it's amazing how sometimes the simpler technologies like just having a webcam are the ones that actually work for for certain use cases yeah yeah another question from uh ravi sharma how uh did you guys stay focused on the core of the product and not get lost with all the creative ideas that you would have had um, I'm not saying we didn't get lost at some points with ideas. <laughs> like we did have a lot of ideas, but uh, it, it did become. Uh, we we tried to, I guess, through I'm not sure. Um, discipline, I guess. I don't know what the right answer is. We just kind of kept telling ourselves because at, at some points within the development process, we found ourselves kind of. Um, um, less motivated than normal to work on it. We were kind of in a in a lull, you know. We weren't like very excited to work. And this was um, one example of this was right when we we found out like the leap motion wasn't working, and no one kind of liked it because the leap motion wasn't working. So we're like, oh, what do we do now? We just and then we just we we're just thinking, sitting there, you know. We weren't excited to work on this, but then um, I guess uh, the I don't know if there's like any kind of magic answer to it, but you just kind of have to, uh, we realized like this was our final project for the year when we had to, we already have well, work invested into it. It's not like we can just throw it out and start on something else. We just have to push through it. You have to get the, you have to have that like mental, I guess, fortitude to kind of just keep going, even if it's tough, like that's inevitable, but you have to keep working on it until you um, go find a solution to your challenge. Cool, yeah. okay. I've got another question from Majuri Shah. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, this person asks, what research methods did your team use? And I'll narrow this slightly to be, uh, firstly, what what uh, led your, your research in actually finding information about sustainable farming? How did you actually get to the point where you had enough information to make this app? Uh, and then also, did you use some kind of evaluation scheme to actually decide on what directions you were going to take with your project? Uh, yeah, first when we started doing research, we quickly realized like there's a lot of information on it and we started like just going down the rabbit hole of like how many different topics there are within sustainable farming. And 
but this is where our uh, sponsor came and helped us because we would have these weekly meetings with our sponsor and she was a researcher for the company that we would be talking to so she really helped us um kind of like she guided us into which directions she gave us options to like hey you could do soil prep or you could do manure or you can do like uh, she kind of guided us in which direction we can take our research. And then after we did a bunch of research on our own, like just using Google, typing in sustainable farming, you know, and just reading some papers, then she uh, validated like um, that research to see if it, it was appropriate and if it actually was accurate and all that. Um, yeah, but um, at first we were trying to cover more than one topic. Uh, sorry, topic. Uh, but um, how we decided on the on the final topic of soil uh, prep was that um, it, um, it was a very visual topic where we wanted to use like the side of the diorama to showcase um, different nutrients in the soil, and it it seemed like one of the easier or like uh, one of the topics that took less time to implement. So we were also aware of the the very strict timeline that we had. So we had to make sure that it was something that wasn't too complicated to implement. It was also something that got across our main message that this was a very educational yet visual uh, tool because we wanted to enter this uh, the contest and we wanted to show it to other people. And finally, for it to be a, a portfolio piece for us. Nice, cool. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase, uh, paraphrase a question from Armando Bervera. Uh, mm -hmm. So why did you choose to build this kind of an application, an application uh, where you use a diorama and it's, it's physical rather than something that's an app? An app would obviously be more accessible to a lot of people, whereas a diorama, it's, it's got some interesting potential. So what led to your decision there? Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's two aspects to this. First is our personal aspect, that we wanted to make something that's a bit different than what we made before. Like all of our projects before were like, were mostly just normal kind of games. They're just digital, you know, like typical video games. Um, but we wanted to like just try something crazy, you know, something that stood out a bit from uh, maybe what other people are making. And we wanted to learn something new. So that was like a personal uh, side of it. But um, we all, there was also um, a side of it uh, based, um, based on the topic of, topic of the project. Uh, because of the learning aspect, um, we found some research and also through our own intuition that um, uh, having a physical um, aspect to the project uh, because of because of our audience like some of them may not be familiar with technology and some of them may not be uh, uh, may have a hard time like understanding just going through an app uh, we wanted to make something that like feels real and had really cool interaction potential and that would translate into something that's more educational um, we found some papers where it actually explained how a physical motor movement can have a better impact on uh, educating people rather than just presenting information to them, you know? So like, uh, we just, like, we picked this idea over others because um, when we were making, we were going through all of our ideas and making decisions about like, which one would be better and which one um, would be I guess worse, I guess this idea really stuck to us because of we thought it would do really well and uh, we liked it. Cool. So now that you've gotten to this point uh, where you have this really interesting project that has a lot of educational potential, mm -hmm. uh, Sterley Duracy asks, in what direction would you like to see the light farm move uh, forwards from here? um what direction uh i don't know if there's any direction like this uh this project is a minimum viable product it's kind of to showcase an idea and to show a case like hey this is 
what could be done with it you know it's kind of like uh, more to get the idea across rather than something that's going to be uh, produced you know um we were talking with our sponsor about actually testing um, this prototype on the field because they have some uh, field officers there. And part of our design of the physical diorama included only using very uh, cheap materials and it, it would be really easy, easy, easily constructed. Sorry, uh, using a uh, cardboard and um, a glue gun really. So uh, we kind of um, made sure that in our, when we designed this thing that it would be really easy to uh, send over to India where they had these field officers actually uh, teaching people these farming practices. Um, but due to some other external problems, we weren't able to follow through with that. And that's uh, that, that kind of sucks because it would have been cool to kind of have your project tested in a real world scenario. Um, but other than that, like uh, all, all of us now are working on um, we either have like uh, jobs or internships over the summer. So we're, this was kind of like a stepping stone where we would be able to, now it's a portfolio piece and we're really glad we got to this far. We got to the point that we did. Cool. Yes, it, it has served you pretty well. So good on you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, a question from Manith Kulatanj. Sorry for butchering your name. Uh, how did you and your team resolve conflicts that could come up during the brainstorm process? Um, I think it's really important when creating a team or when you want to work with a team, you know, if you have the choice uh, of your team, uh, I think it's really important to kind of pick people that are open to criticism and are really, you know, uh, not, um, I don't want to say not confrontational, but kind of just like open to ideas and you want to make sure they have the same goal in mind. Because if you have the same goal in mind, uh, then you can, you understand that both of you are trying to get the same thing out of a project and you're not butting heads all the time. Um, for me, I, I already had like uh, three years of experience with the same guys in my team so um because we had this experience working together we didn't actually have we didn't run into those issues which was kind of great which th th that was the main reason why we picked the team before the project so like whatever the project would have been we would i would have stuck with the team and they're, they're really like nice talented guys and i, I love my team so i didn't actually run into that issue i was really lucky to to work with them that is really lucky. Mm -hmm. uh, and you had some really good systems set up to avoid those conflicts with <laughs> your, your individual pitches for each of your prototypes and evaluation to make sure that people uh, were all on the same page, which was honestly a really impressive thing for a team uh, to be able to sort that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we wanted to be fair with everyone, you know. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. uh, another question from Amber Collinsworth. After having completed this, is there anything you would change in your plan or your approach if you started another year-long project? Um, in my plan or my approach? Um, not, I don't know if I can change anything. Like, um, th this was uh, what we had at the start because it seemed like uh, a good approach approach i guess it's hard to say if you would change anything before knowing how it ends up you know like as i said like before your project is going to change and you inevitably you're going to run into problems beforehand and there's no way to know what the, those problems are until you run into them uh, and this this plan that i'm using here i'm displaying right now is it's not like it's a it's my personal plan or anything this is like just the default designer architecture that pretty much all the designers of all the companies kind of use. It's not something that's like unique or special in any way. There's just kind of a default guideline that everyone uses and all the designers pretty much try to practice. They try to follow this guideline to because it's shown to be successful, I guess, in its approach. Cool. Sterling Duracy has another question. Uh, 
it seems like this is a pretty demanding project. And yes, I, I definitely agree. This sounds like it took a lot of time. How are you able to balance your school life and your other activities with a project like this? Um, that's a good question. Um, one, of the, the, one of the decisions we made as a team uh, before we even picked our project was that uh, we realized because this was going to be our final year in school that we weren't going to be, this wasn't going to be anyone's first priority. So um, we were, we knew that as the year, um, as, as the year developed, each of us would either be um, going to hackathons to, uh, you know, some people would be doing design tests, some people would be interviewing, some people would be just doing all this extracurricular stuff. And each of us were like doing our own thing, like through different parts of this uh, this project. But we kind of agreed that, hey, if, if someone needs to do something, we, we're just going to pick up the slack for them for that week, you know, and then the next week someone else would be picking up the slack for them if they're not able to work or anything. So we kind of had this like team agreement where we would each kind of like pitch in where we could. So we realized that this wasn't a, a zero sum, uh, I guess, game. Like we weren't trying to butt heads into like, hey, you didn't, you weren't able to work for the past two weeks. What's, what's going on? You know, we were kind of tr trying to collaborate and help each other out when we could, I guess. Um, and that gave us time to work when, when like a really busy week did show up or like we were like stomped with uh, assignments or interviews or hackathons or like all this different stuff. This gave us like time to work on that without being too worried about this project, I guess. Cool. Well, thank you so much, TB, and thank you to everyone who asked questions. Uh, there were a lot of really good questions, and this was a really remarkable project. So congratulations on a remarkable year's worth of work. Uh, and now I'm going to pass it off to Medusha to so close fun. off the evening. Cool. Thank oh, you, guys. Oh. Graham, right. awesome job. TV, awesome job. <laughs> um, we should do this often. Come up with some topics. We'll tee it up, and uh, we can go from there.